so when I first heard the the topic of this debate, uh, it was some somewhat upsetting. Uh, in the United States, when someone asks what's the point of diversity, you're pretty sure there are white supremacists or alt-right supporter. Uh, so let me begin by saying that, of course, I support diversity. Uh, but I think that the term diversity uh, often accompanies what I take to be an outright denial of racial hostility and discrimination. When we speak about diversity, it's a way of legitimizing the actions of systems that are constituted illegitimately and based on a discriminatory history and practice. So by the very utterance of the word, we assume that we're here to invite people to be included, and we're trying to simply find out which criterion should be used for their inclusion. But what often happens here is that this piecemeal kind of reform often ends up denying how the situation was constituted in the first place, how a practically homogenous white population occupies UK universities or the field of philosophy in the United States. So the effect of histories of discrimination is in fact not the cultivation of empathy for wrongdoings, but a certain kind of power. The power to define the meaning of diversity or the inclusion of new people and ideas, and more importantly, the speed by which diversification actually happens. In this way, whites still control and maintain structures of access, and what kinds of difference actually count for diversity. So this is why diversification programs, notions that we need to be different and plural and more understanding, usually don't actually change the populations. So in the United States, a sociologist named Eduardo Benilla Silva uh, developed this concept of white habitus. He defines white habitus as a racialized, uninterrupted socialization process that conditions and creates whites' racial tastes, perceptions, feelings, and emotions and their views on racial matters. The most pronounced effect of white habitus is that it promotes a sense of group belonging, a white culture of solidarity, and negative views about non-whites. In these all-white spaces, whites become the standard or norm while anything or anyone different becomes unnatural and problematic. So because of white habitus, racially homogenous spaces get to decide which ideas come in, which ideas they feel to be threatening, which ideas fundamentally challenge the core of what that group feels that they are, what they wish to be. So the diversification actually reifies the homogeneity of whiteness. It's preserved rather than interrupted. And this often happens around the concept and the category of gender. Because race is a rupture, somatically and culturally, in the replication of social processes and philosophies in most universities in the UK, blackness being outside, representing something dangerous, something historically deviant, problematizes the presumed hierarchies of disadvantage that are coded as difference between whites. And this is, this is extremely important because I think that when we talk about the notion of diversity, we often describe bodies, whether some bodies fit, some bodies don't fit. But rarely do we talk about the histories and the worldviews that bodies bring into certain locations. So if you talk about the process of colonization or genocide because of racism, then you're not going to get the same kind of bourgeois notions of class difference or gender that you may have amongst white populations. Said differently, if you look at the history of feminism or the history of white women in the United States right now under Trump, those are not going to be the most liberal populations. But when we theorize them, when we think about their relationship to other racial groups, we assume that there's a natural allegiance because all these groups are excluded, all these groups are discriminated against, all these groups are oppressed. There's going to be a fundamental difference that cannot be accommodated by the systems that we already have in place. And this is the important part of diversification, that there's not just the preservation of a certain demographic population, but there's also this impetus to preserve the ideas that that population has given us. There's this idea that the curricula, that the canon of philosophy, that the ways that we talk about diversity and what counts as difference is in fact accurate, even though there's no one who's actually different formulating those rules itself. So when we talk then about anti-blackness, or we talk about indigeneity, or we talk about not belonging or immigrants, we're not simply talking about bodies of inclusion. We're talking about a process of empire. We're talking about histories that have reified certain things that we pretend are contingent within white society, philosophy, and their ideations. It approaches the limit of the idea and exposes the inapplicability of the universal assumptions that were formulated on white people and the intuitions to anyone else but white people. 
But this rupture is, is not simply political. Often when we talk about diversity, we talk of it as if it's a political mandate, that you have to have the right liberal politics to incorporate certain bodies, black male bodies, black female bodies, Muslims. You have to be on the right side of the political spectrum. But what concretely changes about the way the society is organized? Very little. The ways that institutions legitimize themselves is through the ideological effect of saying that, yes, we're inclusive, because that allows even people who are fundamentally discriminated against and killed by the police state, by the people who don't warrant certain people on college campuses or in certain neighborhoods, to appear as if they didn't pull the trigger themselves or put the person in jail or stab them. Y'all don't have guns in this society the same way we do in America. Forgive me. All right? But at the same time, that's not full, you're not fully absolved. Because the mandate for why the police act the way they do, the mandate for why certain institutions act the way they do, is to preserve the certain kinds of ideologies that have already been established amongst their white citizens, their, their specific clientele. So we need a schematic rupture. What do I mean by that? Well, if we're going to start being serious about diversity, then we have to admit that the process of colonization and empire created these ideas that we hold so dearly and is also the engine driving the exclusion of black and brown and Muslim bodies, that those ideas themselves may be the problem. That there's a falsity in the illusion that Europe has in fact created universal ideas that are interested in the problem of the human. Rather, Europeans created theories to talk about the problems of Europeans. So this involves an examination of the cultural imperialism on the concept of the human itself, constructs of gender, the way that class is encoded in different kinds of demographic uh, characteristics, the history of white men raping black men in Africa and throughout the diaspora, the homoeroticism involved in racial domination, the rape of black people by white women, the violence of white women as slave owners and colonizers, the racism and patriarchal imperialist ventures of suffragettes, and of course, capitalism. These are themes that fundamentally challenge the ways that we've articulated certain subjects. And philosophy is in dire need of a rigid empiricism that allows us to study subjects as they are, not as we imagine them to be. Said this way, decolonization then is not simply an invitation for wider working class solidarity. Drawing from rich black radical traditions, radical Muslim intellectual traditions, right? authors like Frantz Fanon, the Black Panthers, the echoes of people who fought for freedom in the Haitian Revolution in the late 1800s. This exposes to us that there is a very different train of thinking necessary to resurrect true humanity. In case you didn't know, Europe is a failed project. So the sociogenic principle that Fanon introduces us to in Black Skin, White Mass tells us that society's colonial and colonial powers create entities and ideologies to sustain their civilization and way of life. He says that this is their metaphysics, so to speak. Here, Sylvia Winter, borrowing from Fanon, indicts the very notion of the human, saying that while it may in fact have a biological origin, that what we do call and designate as biological is itself a cultural construct. So to build diversity off of the idea that there's just a shared biology, without the ability to recognize how ideas and trajectories, how different notions of history, how different problems with the status quo, the very problem of philosophy and thought itself, originates in a very specific time, as an effect of a very specific people, as a very specific set of triumphs, and then try to apply that to everyone else, is doomed from the very beginning. Said differently, if we're truly invested in diversity, then it means that we may have to speak about the inapplicability of European thought and perhaps the end of philosophy itself. Thank you.